Thank you all for coming out on a winter night. I was telling uh, Vicki, my wife here, that a few years back we held a Ward 4 meeting here and uh, it was snowing like this. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why it snows every time we do Ward 4, but or often, but it often does. Yes, I think it was February that year. So usually what uh, we do is I talk about a few things relevant to the city and to the to the uh, ward and then really we just throw things open uh, and we do have Matt we're going to talk a little bit about the Mohawk situation and you know anything else you want to talk about so we've been working very hard uh, over the last three years because conditions have been challenging the for the Board of Aldermen for the you know the, the city in general uh, with COVID, but I think we've accomplished some significant milestones. We have gotten a lot of recognition in the last year or so. We were said to be the second safest city in the United States. Uh, that is our priority, is to make Nashua even safer in any way that we possibly can. Uh, we were recognized as being the fourth best run city in the United States. This means they measure the quality, what they feel the quality of services are versus the cost. In other words, they're measuring effective, efficient city government. We think we have that. Uh, we have a AAA bond rating that was reaffirmed for the, the, the second agency reaffirmed that. Uh, we're often recognized as among the best places to live. So we think we have a great community, great city, and uh, certainly great residents that are helping it make, help us make it that way. Uh, the, in terms of this neighborhood, this ward, there's some uh, very significant things going on because it, of course, includes the downtown. Uh, you see the School Street housing going up on, well, School Street, the parking lot there. This is the, really the largest investment in Nashville's downtown in more than 100 years in terms of and especially because they're building apartments from the ground up, which is the first time you've seen that since 1900, uh, on any kind of scale like this. So this is probably 40, 50 million dollars of private investment. And we know that we could get more of this if we could get some free parcels, and we're, we're always working on that. Uh, Performing Arts Center is, of course, about to open. That helped to attract all of this private investment because the builder for that from Florida says, I really didn't know anything about Nashville except for this Performing Arts Center and that interested me. Um, we have the Performing Arts Center opening in April. We think that will bring tens of thousands of people downtown and the intent there is to build a stronger, healthier downtown economy, grow the tax base, and uh, improve the business climate, make a healthier business climate downtown, uh, and just make our downtown a place where people want to go and uh, be entertained, eat in the restaurants. And we see across the country that downtowns are evolving from what used to be daytime office space, office use. You know, the old days, the modern was there, it was full of people in the, in, in the daytime. We really don't have that many daytime employees down there anymore. And it's not nearly what there used to be. Uh, but the uh, downtowns are evolving into more of a entertainment, restaurants, uh, uh, shopping, this kind of thing for where people want to go in the evenings and weekends and things like that. So we're seeing that trend and, and we're trying to really encourage it because that is a way to keep the downtown alive. Uh, we have also in this ward the reconstruction of what formerly were the Bronstein, Bronstein Apartments. That is being rebuilt into what's now going to be called Monaghan Manor. That is a 210 unit or so um, project of afford affordable housing. Like There's a few handful of market rate units there, but it, it is in ranges of affordability helping us with a very serious housing crisis that we have. Vacancy rates really low, uh, rents escalating rapidly because demand is so high, value of houses going up, and we can talk about the revaluation. State ordered, state mandated, state supervised. 
uh, something we would not really have chosen to do at this moment if we had a choice. Um, so um, we do have this housing crisis. And very significantly, and Sandy has been uh, you know, a neighborhood activist and uh, involved in the little Florida neighborhood for a long time regarding everything but especially this. Uh, the Mohawk Tannery is a um, site of significant pollution. Uh, a, a tannery existed there for 60 years from 1924 to 1984, closed in 84, leaving lagoons full of sludge, so, tannery sludge with a lot of pollutants in them. And hides. Yes, <laughs> like really messy. Really, it used to smell like to high heaven, I, you know, when it was in operation. I don't, I'm sure Lori remembers it, I, Sandy remembers it. I had someone tell me just yesterday that they grew up on Denise Street and they smelled it. Now, Denise Street is way out Broad Street. So this was all over the place. It did close, but leaving this pollution, this mess, which has not been cleaned up in the last 39 years. So some years ago, several years ago, the EPA came and suggested that they would be willing to design and implement a cleanup uh, if we were to do a public-private partnership with a developer that would turn the land into something productive. So this has been in negotiation for four years. And Matt, and uh, this is Tim Cummings, the Economic Development Director, very involved in this. Many details have been discussed and negotiated, but uh, bottom line is, <coughs> you know, the EPA is coming up with $6 million, the developer with some more money. Uh, they've kind of developed the design, something they've used before. It is a consolidation, and uh, there's going to be a wall that's going to contain. Consolidation meaning all this stuff is going to be put in one place. A wall will hold it uh, from uh, preventing it from migrating towards the river. And there will be an impermeable cap on the top and the rest of the site will be developed for housing. At least that's the proposal. 530 or so units, a mixture of apartments and condos. We think this will bring in a million, two million dollars of tax money a year. Uh, it will clean up the site. And <clears throat> um, there will be 10 acres left over that will be open space and recreation for the city. Uh, there are other details as to how this is going to get paid for. The city is going to have to make a contribution, which we uh, will quickly recover as a result of the tax money coming in. Uh, the housing authority is going to loan some money. That will get paid back. 20% of the apartments will be affordable, uh, and they will be making the developer a $2.3 million contribution to the city's affordable housing trust fund. Um, now, we're here, we can answer any questions regarding that, so I haven't covered at all at all, all of the details. But um, those are some of the large uh, issues going on in Ward 4 uh, and in the city in general. Uh, just before we move to questions, you know, we've tried to improve our infrastructure over the last few years, paving many, many streets at a much faster pace than ever before, something the Board of Aldermen has been very supportive of. Uh, we are improving, and you don't see this, but uh, the sewer infrastructure, we're uh, replacing and lining many more feet or miles of <coughs> underground pipes than uh, before and have really re totally revamped the uh, sewage treatment plant, which at one point fell into very significant uh, decline uh, and condition. So millions of dollars has gone into that. Um, those are some of the things that uh, you know are going on. We have done this revaluation. It has raised the value of houses considerably. The reason that we wouldn't have chosen this as the moment is that houses went up 41% since the last revaluation. Commercial property did not go up like that. 
Some of the Pheasant Lane Mall is claiming their property went down in value. That's the city's biggest property tax fair. So what the, according to state law, taxes are allocated <coughs> based upon fair market value of all 29,000. Pre-revaluation, how homes represented about 65% of the entire value of the city, meaning they paid 65% of the taxes. Post-revaluation, <clears throat> as a result of the increase in home values <clears throat> and the corresponding n no, no increase in commercial values are limited, now homes pay you know, higher than 65%, pushing up towards 70. So that is caused uh, people's taxes to go up, uh, like uh, at Seven Grand Avenue and probably wherever you live as well. So um, uh, we will watch this carefully, and if we can find a period of time when homes go down and commercial does not, we will probably we'll begin we'll do a st what's called a statistical, a, more, a quicker revaluation than this one, which was ordered to be a so-called full measure and list <coughs> to try to correct the, the uh, result of this, of this revaluation. Cindy's working hard in the state Senate on issues uh, like uh, state pension system. Uh, uh, we, like 10% of the city budget more than 10% of the city budget goes for state pensions. We're all part of the state pension system. Um, the way we, Nashville got into this decades ago was we were promised we'd be always, there'd always be a 35% contribution by the state. And um, they stopped doing that. So, and they mismanaged the system. So the bill has gone from like $8 million a year some years ago to like $35 million. And, uh, the cumulative, just that, the breaking of that legal commitment, 35% com contribution, has cost the city close to $80 million cash already. So that, we could pay for a new middle school with that in cash if they hadn't broken that promise. Cindy's trying to correct that, so thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. We're trying to get some of the money. Last year, they di we did get 7.5%, um, which was great, but that was a one-year deal. Right, so Cindy's yeah, trying to. Worth pointing out that they're over, over drawing the contributions so that they can correct their management. They're yeah. Trying to get it 100 percent funded, which I think you pointed out you'd only need if literally everybody retired on the same day. Or you wanted to get rid of. Oh, what? No. Yeah. So what Tom is speaking of is that the retirement system says this is not us. Eighty percent of the money we are paying in, which means 25 million plus per year, is to build the assets, which currently are about seven and a half, eight billion dollars, grow them to, to be, quote, 100 percent funded. Something for a city and a state we think is totally unnecessary for reasons that we could discuss. But those are some of the things going on. Why don't we ask uh, Tom, Lori, anybody, you have anything you want to add at this point? Or? We're working with uh, <coughs> energy managers. We're working with our energy manager, Doria Brown, to uh, lower, hopefully lower our electric rates. We're going to be uh, part of the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire, who when, once we join, we hope we'll be able to lower the electric rates for all natural ratepayers. So that's something we're working on as well. Yes, very important. So this, the way this would work is we're in with 17 other communities. And this is pursuant to state law. This coalition takes over the buying of power for the Eversource customers. So you would not see any change. They still bill you. They still get paid for delivering the electricity. But the power purchases are made by this coalition as opposed to Eversource. They believe uh, and there are a lot of experts involved, that we can bid for power at different times and save money uh, on power purchases, maybe a cent a kilowatt, maybe 
more, maybe five cents, maybe whatever, we'll, we'll see. But uh, the point is to try to lower electric bills. And the Board of Aldermen is going to be voting on this. Lori's been on this committee um, uh, within the next few weeks, I would think, right? Doria also already saved us a bunch of money. Because yes. We're, I mean, I'm paying like 22 cents a kilowatt hour because I have Eversource. And she signed a contract like in March, was it? A couple of years ago. So we're paying 5.9 for many of the city accounts still. Now that lasts only for a couple of years, but still. That's all, that's all money that's not going into people's, you know, property tax bills right. and all that kind of stuff. Right. Is he That's for the team. Out there and All right. How about audience questions here? Any questions, comments? Yes, I Fred. I follow up to Laura and Lori. So they're going to take that mic or should I just speak loud? Okay. Just take the mic. That'd be yeah. perfect. Thank so you. you pick up for you better? Yes, sir. Take okay. a talking stick. Well, my name is Fred Sheldon. I live at Seven Grand Ave. I think that's part of the policy, right? Introduce who you are and where you're from. Um, I was just talking to Cindy earlier. I have a couple of questions, but I'll start with this one as a follow up. Um, I have my phone uh, with, Veri my, with Verizon. I don't have it bundled with anything. I have my internet phone landline, and the internet is about fifty fifty nine ninety nine a month. Then I have caller ID, which is approximately nine dollars a month. Now the bill, before I make any phone calls, including line fees, taxes, surcharges, is one hundred and thirteen dollars a month. That's before I make any phone calls. And this so, is a landline? This is, this is for the landline and the internet. Yeah. It's all the recovery fees, all the service <laughs> fees, and I haven't made any phone calls because I use my cell phone. So <laughs> I figured over the next 26 years I'd be paying over $53,000 for phone and internet. And is there anything we can do to talk to the PUC about reducing their charges? I mean, that's a lot of money a month. I'm a senior citizen. I can't afford that. I mean, I just, it's ridiculous. It's, it's robbery. I mean, it's before I make any phone calls. And then I'm paying $60 a month for my cell phone. Now, the city does not have the authority. We only have the authority that is given to us. By no, but I was thinking this, the state level. Maybe. To, to, I don't know. The city operates independently, so we don't have any authority over them to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. They're... The commissioners are appointed by the governor, and they've been acting oddly this year on energy, like getting rid of the New Hampshire Saves program that everybody loves. Mm -hmm. They got rid of, they had to bring it back. Um, I can try to talk to them, but I think your example illustrates why people are getting rid of their landmines. It's because they're expensive, and most people don't use them. Mm -hmm. I have one at my house mm -hmm. because our cell service is terrible <laughs> <laughs> in our neighborhood. But on my cable package, I think the landline is pretty much free. Yeah, well, I thought about getting rid of it, but yes, I just wanted to be safe it. with it just in case, but still. Other than that, but anyway, I do one more follow-up question. I love living in Nashua, and I love Mind Falls Park. And is, are there any long-term plans for the canal to get it going again? Because it's got so atrophied, because we can't get it moving, or it'll dig off the banks. Well, the reason that the reason it's not moving is that, um, well, just you know, for background, sure. the, the canal was created to power the mills. Right. So oh, I get that. So the river is at a higher level in the canal, or the, the river is at a lower level and the canal is higher. And they, in the 70s, there was a hydroelectric f facility built at Mine Falls. Right. So the, the level of the water is uh, in the off, off the flow, the, the flow away, off through the canal. Um, is limited in order to maximize the flow through the hydroelectric facility. So to the extent you were to divert, now, I, you know, whether this, the balance is really correct, I'm, you know, I don't know, but 
to the because it would be great to have the the canal flowing again. Um, Not so much flowing, but it's just gotten so full of reeds you can't canoe through it anymore without getting tangled your paddle in in all kinds of stuff. The well, sediment is just filling up. Well, the river specialist yeah. um, works for Matt, but, yeah, but I can certainly try and answer. That's my question. Yeah, yeah. Is there could be some the dredging system done. So, so you, you, you absolutely you can't get it moving yeah. without. <laughs> yeah, we we've, we've gotten this question somewhat frequently, actually, uh, from folks who walk my Falls Park. The the answer is not a, it's not an inspiring one though, and it is that because of the the way that the canal has sort of settled over time, yes. and you've had this growth happen, the dredging that would need to be done would of course be expensive. So let's put that aside for right. a second. But there's actually an engineering component to it that would be substantial in nature that would have to be done to stabilize the banks of the canal if there were more flow or an alternative level in the canal. So is it impossible? No, it's not. The mayor is absolutely correct that it isn't controlled in part due to the three megawatt facility at Mine Falls, right. at the Mine Falls station. But the engineering and the, the flow analysis and the stabilization that would be necessary it's, make it's it... It's not cost effective. It's not cost effective. <laughs> I would agree it would be nice to walk through that area and see the water moving and see more recreation. And I think the growth within the river and sort of the stagnation of some of the water has created an environment that that's not necessarily, it's not conducive to that. But the reality is the cost is simply too much to take on right now as a city. Hope that answers your question. No, that's, no I, I, I knew that everything yeah. has a cost. Yeah. And <laughs> unfortunately, that is the, the major impediment here. Vic's father used no, to well, swim. I'll let in there. somebody else ask a question, and then I'll throw in another two cents. Vic's father used to swim in the canal near where you live. Really? Yeah. No way. A long time ago. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's great. People used to swim there when it was still moving. It everything. dies in it. It's it's a weird color. Color. Yeah, it dies. Yeah. That's what yeah. I heard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, any any other questions though? Not necessarily. We can just let Fred well, take I'll, over. Uh, I'll go again. <laughs> Go ahead. I love the city. Let me just say that <laughs> before I start. I've <laughs> been here since 98. I love it. My house backs up against Mines Falls, so it's wonderful. Okay. Yep. So, Fair question. You know, so, uh, yeah, well, I wouldn't anyway. But um, I, It's nice to know the library has uh, eliminated its late fees. Mm -hmm. well, it was very nice news the other day. And I do have a question, uh, and I may be misinformed, that the that the, the, the parking at the library, 25 cents for 20 minutes, uh, that, that those fees go to the city's general coffer. And I'm wondering if, if I'm correct in that or if I'm not, is there any way to change that? Because I know the library has done a wonderful job in rehabbing and needs its money to change that structure so that it goes to the library instead of <clears throat> back to the or this Or does the city then collect all that money and then give them... Well, the, 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 you're right that it just goes to the, quote, the city coffers. Anything, <clears throat> with the exception of anything over 728000 goes to the Downtown Improvement Committee in total of parking meters and lease parking. Mm -hmm. It certainly could be directed to the library, but the library's budget is $4 million a year. So, I mean, it's not like we're not giving money to the library. Well, I didn't say you weren't. I was just curious um, as to how it all... Still works. Um, it could be directed to the library, but that would be a decision for you know the board of aldermen or right. some some legal change would have to be made. Right. You want to talk about the plaza? Yes. So there is. Speaking of the library, there's there's a few <laughs> things a going. Yeah. There's a few like things <laughs> they have done us a study. They've done us they've done an analysis of their building, and th that suggests it needs very significant repairs. Probably not the best designed, uh, very inefficient from a heating point of view, but it's very difficult to do anything about that because the concrete just carries yes. carries the, the cold, you know, in, into the building. Um, I think they're saying, you know, a complete job is $30 million. So no one's made any decisions regarding that. But... In the plaza uh, between the library and the Court Street building, the city undertook to design a new park and sort of really upgrade this. Uh, although we had hoped that the cost, 
and, the, and we had a, you know, uh, landscape architects, you know, it was very expertly done. So there's a design and a concept plan online. Uh, but the cost came in considerably higher than we had hoped. And the cost came in at around four and a half million dollars. Originally, we'd hoped less than half of that, but in any event. So as part of the federal funds we received, ARPA, so-called ARPA money, a million and a half was allocated to the project, not nearly enough to finish it, uh, but maybe enough to do, quote, phase one. But Senator Shaheen and Congresswoman Custer worked very hard on this. They did, they achieved what is now called uh, congressionally designated spending, and they got a $3 million allocation, which on top of the money that we ha already have is probably enough to now undertake a complete improvement of that park to make it m much more than what it is now, uh, which is not very good. Uh, so, and, then, and there's been some bad activity there. The idea is to kind of bring people into it and make it kind of alive so that people don't fight and, you know, this kind of thing that was going on. So, and to, so people can enjoy the space, uh, significant downtown space. So we're really optimistic about what can be done there. Yes, Barry. I know that recently there's been sort of... Um, an increase in attention on unhoused individuals around the state, particularly in Manchester, but I know right. that the problem has existed and continues to exist here in Nashville. Is the city um, looking at anything or doing anything as a, the result of sort of the greater attention being paid to unhoused individuals throughout the state? I know the city of Manchester is, uh, you know, asking for additional resources and, and making more, you know, shelter housing available for unhoused individuals. What is the city of Nashua doing to sort of address the current plight of those individuals? And do you anticipate sort of a migration of individuals potentially from Manchester or other communities into our city? Well, we think that's already happened. But the answer is, um, you know, this is a complex problem. We joined Manchester in asking for more resources. I mean, the state says they're putting a lot of money to this, but the way that letter got generated is the mayors of Nash of, of uh, New Hampshire meet together f fairly regularly, and we wrote the, a second letter regarding this, and we this time we got a meeting. And um, you know the what the mayors are saying is, look, you say you're doing this stuff, but we don't see anything. I mean, we don't, you know, where where, where is this money? What's it doing? Um, now, it's not easy for the state to solve this problem. I mean, you know, but are they really putting a lot towards it? Um, not really. Um, I mean, we could talk about some of the... I can talk about this. So we're going to turn this over to Cindy in a second in terms of what the state is doing. But yes, the city is trying to address it. But actually, I think we have to do more. But the first thing is we have been very optimistic and encouraging concerning the expanded, the new homeless shelter on Spring Street being done by the, by the Na National Soup Kitchen, a $9 million project, to which the city contributed, you know, some money. I mean, they mostly raised it themselves, which is quite good. That has a capacity of like 92 people in, you know, much, much better conditions, which doubles their capacity in much, much better conditions. Um, so we're optimistic about that. But... Should we, we have a, we have a, you know, a task force that's kind of looking at this and trying to come up with solutions. Prob I, you know, I think like Manchester, we're going to have to become more involved and uh, because we don't want, you know, homeless camps taking over, which is what we saw, you know, what Manchester had, right? And um, so it's good that you're asking about it. Um, I think we do need to do more than we are which means more resources, et cetera, but um, uh, we have to just figure out exactly what else to do. Because there are homeless caps in the park. Yes, right. And, you know, as many people point out, it's not, you know, it's mental health. Like, there's a lot of, a lot of people, it is drug addiction. I, you know, there are people that outreach workers try to persuade to go to the shelter. Now, the shelters aren't very nice, so hopefully this 
new one will be more welcoming or you know people will want to go there you know more but people there's some people that just you know they don't want to do it you know and they may have problems and uh, you know uh, they don't want to live with other people or whatever so you know that has to be addressed in some way as well but Cindy is going to talk about and then we're going to go to Tom but Cindy he's really very involved with this so Cindy's going to talk about the state okay. stuff so I think we can't consider unhoused or homeless people as one group because there are some people that were working, maintaining a place to live, paying rent, lost a job, had a big medical expense, whatever, and were they lost their housing. The state's done a better job, I think, trying to um, use the ARPA money to address that portion. But it's long term, right, because you have to build stuff. The governor created this $100 million housing fund of ARPA money. S um, 60 million of it went to develop new housing across the state. It's going to result, um, it was sorry, $50 million will result in 2,500 new apartments. That's not a lot. We need 22,000 more units, but that is $20,000 per unit, it's not a lot. And I, I checked that number like five times on my calculator, but $50 million gets you 2,500 affordable apartments. But it takes time, they have to get permitted, and then they have to get built. What we haven't done a good job with is the the shelter kinds of homeless individuals, people who either are in shelters or could be but don't want to go to shelters. The current state budget actually cut the shelter funding, but as compared to the previous year, it was a mistake. And I was unsuccessful in getting it rectified. I am trying to make sure we don't make that mistake again in the next two-year budget, because we actually reduced homeless shelter funding by over one and a half million dollars at a time when the need was growing. It is a, a crisis of mental illness. We are desperate for the workforce. We are, our mental health centers around the state are seeing currently half of the patients they were seeing before the pandemic, only half. <coughs> and they don't have the workforce. So all of this has been building for a long, long time. But the crisis and draw on the healthcare system, I think, has has shown us how vulnerable we are. Nothing is going to get fixed quickly, but but we're working and trying. And I just was in a meeting yesterday about this with the housing people. Sorry, that's so depressing. <laughs> All right, so my list of things that the city is doing um, starts with this morning because the mayor's opioid task force just met this morning. <laughs> They have at last revised their name to be the Mayor's Task Force on Substance Misuse, which anybody who was working with the Safe Station or Frontline stuff knew that it wasn't just opioids. It was a substance abuse surge, and opioids were just the most readily available product. So now we're starting to actually look at the situation so that we don't disqualify people uh, who might have had opioids and qualified at one point, but now they're off opioids, but they're using meth, which is a whole different problem. You cannot approach the person falling asleep the same way as the person with the strength of 50 men. Um, or you can't address the different needs that people have 
part of the way and then say, oh, you don't qualify because you succeeded in your recovery from one thing, but now you're struggling with alcoholism or something else. So taking a more holistic view is a huge step forward, and it can't be under, underestimated. The second thing they're doing is tomorrow is the annual point in time count. So myself and a ton of other um, nonprofit social workers um, will be going downtown to try to find all of the homeless encampments we can find. All of the organizations are collaboratively sharing how many homeless people are coming in. And this is not something that's easy to do under normal circumstances because of HIPAA, because of privacy regulations, because of all those types of things. But this is the one year where everybody collaborates on figuring out exactly what the scope of the problem is. So those are some things that we're actively doing right now. Things that we've been doing, um, I know uh, Director Sullivan and Director Cummings have been involved in supporting nonprofit organizations that over the years have been expanding or modifying their program. So as Senator Rosenwald said, you can't just call somebody homeless like they've always been that way and they always will be. These are people who are struggling with issues that created a, a functional level that resulted in homelessness. Mm -hmm. To say nothing of like the rising rents or the property values increasing, uh, the cost of medical care. If you get the wrong illness, if you have long-haul symptoms from COVID and your income is devastated, you're probably going to end up homeless. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of individual factors which need to be addressed. Um, I know that Bridges, for example, has been expanding its services and its emergency supports with city support, with logistical support. I know that Stepping Stones is in the process of addressing youth homelessness, which is a side of the pipeline that we have not adequately addressed at all. We've, we've known for over 10 plus years that there were large numbers of unsheltered youth that were in their 16, there were 16, 17, 18 in our school system that were floating from family to family or, you know, in non-traditional uh, housing settings. And we couldn't count them because the school district used different mechanisms at the time. Now we have an organization which actually has a drop-in center and is giving kids a place to go to so they can express what their needs are instead of us trying to identify what they are before we really even know who's involved and just throwing darts into the, into the darkness hoping we hit the right target. So those are some very encouraging things. Stepping Stones uh, is in the process of figuring out how to, how to launch a emergency shelter for younger um, homeless people, uh, 18 to 23 I think is their metric, um, and also a transitional housing program to help move people out of the shelter system. Because like the canal that we were talking about earlier, if there isn't any movement, sediment piles up. So while some people have been staying in the shelters for long periods of time because there's no medically of, like supportive options for them in terms of like if you're a double amputee you can't live on the third floor. Because we don't have that variety of housing choice and because the complex medical needs, the qualification and eligibilities for insurance or even trying to get into the mental health center can take months if not longer, that creates a lot of compounded problems. They can't pay their phone bills. They can't communicate with anybody. They can't hear from the housing authority or that crisis intervention worker who has the opportunity for them. So these are things that, we, that nonprofits have been struggling with. About four years ago, Maple Street Shelter closed, which meant that we, and as a city, really only have one shelter as a vendor to turn to. We do have the rescue mission, but a faith-based rescue mission is fundamentally different than an emergency shelter with a focus on housing stability and recovery with employment support programs and you know family-based care and, and that type of thing. The missions have been expanding their services too. We just opened a women's mission which the city has sorely needed for a very very long time and that increases by far the capacity for unsheltered single women. <clears throat> programs like um, Cynthia Day at Harbor Care and run through maybe some people know it as Keystone is undergoing renovations so that they can better meet the need. But a lot of this was initiated while programs were more or less shut down because of COVID. And they haven't finished all, all of their renovations, their work, or that, all that kind of thing. What I can tell you is that the providers, like the shelter, that are now opening these new programs are running into situations of staffing shortages because there isn't an ongoing or stable funding source to, to pay an overnight per diem worker or an overnight staff worker enough to make it worth it. I used to run an emergency shelter. One of my first months on the job, one of my uh, overnight shelter staff passed away because of heart issues that were compounded by working overnights. It's not 
easy to work overnight. You're on a different schedule than everybody else. So doing it for pay less than what you'd get at McDonald's, it's, that's a short line of applicants. So while we can expand the, the buildings and the facilities, we're still going to run into the same staffing issues. And that's where more community awareness and more involvement needs to happen. Like people need to look at these programs and spread the word. People need to talk about the homeless not as though they are an inconvenience to be pushed aside, but a problem we can rally around. Because you're more likely to get people willing to pitch into the problem if people aren't going to attack them at the same time for enabling what they claim is the problem. So these are some things that the city is helping with. The city library supports Employment Connect uh, every year, which is a, a job searching support um, fair. They are the meeting place for any number of outreach workers and case managers and have been very, very supportive where a lot of people could complain about, oh, we have a lot of indigent people or people with, you know, unusual needs. The libraries, they're champions. They're always showing up and they're ready to help however they can. And we're lucky to have such a great group of staff as a resource because we don't have a city-run warming station or, you know, facility that they can all turn to. We rely heavily, for the most part, on nonprofits that have to watch that bottom line and have to be doing things during the day when people are out. So the last thing I would point out is, with regards to people who are unsheltered, the, the change in the shelter facilities that the soup kitchen is implementing right now is a major shift. Because Ash Street Shelter has been in continuous operation for over 35 years. Continuous operation, seven days a week, 24 hours a day and it was originally a residential building. It wasn't built with anywhere near the ability, like the floorboards have all been replaced so many times, I don't even know it's real, like original anymore. The washing machines, you know, leak onto a room full of, of beds. It is a very, very problematic building and this is what people who are homeless have had to go through. It's not like they're out in Mind Falls just because they feel like they wanna go camping in the middle of a blizzard. It's because the conditions there are, are very overcrowded the facilities are terrible. There isn't a, a kitchen for men. There's a microwave and there's nothing else. So if you're working overnight or if you're working uh, third shift, you're eating sandwiches if you're lucky. And you're doing that in the same room that people are all trying to watch TV. It's a throwaway. The facilities that they've been working with for years have been <coughs> sorely inadequate. And the only reason they've worked at all is because we had a much smaller shelter population in the past. We had other shelters that we could <coughs> transition people back and forth, and none of that's there anymore. So the new program that they're launching on Spring Street is much more adaptable, and it primarily offers benefits for families, where if you have everybody crowded into a room, you really can't take anyone with more than two kids, maybe three. And there are some families that are much bigger, where the, the husband has to split off with the older kid, and the, the wife has to split off with the two younger kids just to find beds, and half of that family's energy is spent just trying to stay together whenever they can. Being able to put them in the same place together means they won't get disqualified for housing programs that they need. They'll be able to go into those programs like Monaghan that we just modified to allow for different housing sizes. And in those months where you have smaller families and more one or two person families, they can shrink the room and they can put more people in. That kind of adaptability has been long needed uh, in the Nashua area. Women, single women and single men are going to have more dignified housing. They're going to have better accommodations and better facilities. But we're not talking about the Ritz. We're talking about a bunch of bed, uh, bed books. We're talking about a bunch of bunk beds in a common room shared with a bunch of strangers that you've never met. But at least now it has air conditioning. Because if you remember the hottest days of the summer and how hot you were at home, try imagine sharing it with 20 people. So the city's been doing a lot. The city has always been supportive of the shelter programs in providing on-site guidance when it comes to fire marshals and safe practices, environmental health supports. They've been supportive of making sure that the police are ready to respond when necessary, but actually qualified and partnered with places like Mobile Crisis to make sure you're not unnecessarily um, enforcing things that could be handled a different way. So there's a lot of things that the city does. There's definitely more that we can do. I think the, the city welfare budget has declined, if you look at over the 10-year uh, average, the 15 year average is just horrible because it used to be over a million dollars. Um, there's a number of things that we can look at in terms of allowing accessibility, like maybe the whole health department doesn't take a lunch break at the same time when everyone's trying to get in. Those are just minor infrastructure reforms that might be possible. 
this is a crisis that's happening regionally. But Nashua, the reason we haven't had this massive pileup is because we really are handling it as best we can. For more information, consult my little magnet here, because I have all kinds of resources on it that are germane to this. So <laughs> if you check this little thing right here, I always keep the nonprofits and everything that's going on uh, up to date. So does anyone have questions regarding uh, Mohawk? Anything? I don't. <laughs> because we brought all these experts. <laughs> I, I didn't unfortunately make it to your meeting on the asphalt plan. What was, how did that meeting go at City Hall a few weeks ago? <clears throat> well, um, the idea here, the, the, what Fred is asking about is Newport construction, which has a facility on Temple Street east of downtown, has proposed the construction of an asphalt plant. Now, um, the zoning in that area is complicated because traditionally it is an industrial area and has an, an industrial zone. In that type of zone, asphalt plants are an allowed use. But fortunately, some years ago, the city put also a so-called overlay district uh, in that area, which was designed to encourage a transition to more residential uses. So a kind of a, an evolving transitional neighborhood. Now I suppose, I mean this was, you, you know, you could have, you know, they could have just undone the whole industrial thing, but, you know, you can't it's not really realistic to take a whole group of users and just say, sorry, you know, you're all like uh, not allowed anymore, you know. So, um, so this, this, um, this overlay district was put on, which requires a lot more showing than in terms of trying to develop something like an asphalt plant than the underlying zoning would require. It requires a, uh, like five points to be proven uh, that uh, it won't in decrease property values, etc. So we don't think the asphalt plant can meet the test of the overlay zone. So in the end, we don't think it should be allowed. But this is a decision for the planning board, not for the board of aldermen. It's a decision for the planning board. We, we're optimistic. This thing has been delayed over and over. The city has environmental experts. We've now gotten appraisers. We've you know trying to show that the uh, conditions, the, the, the requirements of the overlay zone cannot be met. Why are we doing that? Because we don't want uh, a smelly asphalt plant in the middle of an area that we want to create, uh, we want to be residential. For example, this is right next to the Henry Hanger building. Henry Hanger um, is permitted for 80 some units of housing. And we, you know, they're starting to work on a little bit. I mean, that's another story, but we really want that to happen. Now, if there were an asphalt plant, would you want to live next door? I, you know, so we're trying to make sure that uh, um, it doesn't happen. But again, it's up to the planning board, and you know, the applicant does have the underlying zoning and. Apparently, there's probably a lot of money into this in this because the applicant is very persistent and lawyers and you know they have experts. Uh, they're pushing this very hard, so uh, you know it's not like this is you know going to be resolved uh, next week. And the next scheduled hearing is February 17 or something. 16th, or? I believe. 16. That meeting did not yeah, that, so this thing has been delayed, you know, October, November, December, January, February. Now it's now it's set for February. That could get, be delayed as all well because that, both sides are trying to get all, you know, well, we, we need this, we need that, we want to get this expert. Well, well the, this expert wants to respond to that one. So, uh, you know, it, it keeps getting delayed, yeah, which yeah. is not a bad thing, but eventually a decision, you know, has well, to... Of course, the, the traffic, I imagine, would increase tremendously because didn't... 
we're thinking of in, in, enlarging the bike path past that area to... Yeah, yeah. We've got right past it going uh, the uh, East Hollow Street uh, rail corridor, rail, rail, uh, rail, trail. rail trail. Yeah, so it's like right next to that. Right. So, yes, it's like 150 trucks a day or something like that are projected, 130. So the it's, yeah. It's already tough in town. Imagine what that would do to downtown. And what about the heaviness of the trucks on the city streets? Yes, that I'm could sure happen. That's been addressed. Sure. And our, our old aging infrastructure bikes. Tr trucks um, trucks things. wear the streets out much more quickly than cars. So we're working on this. And we've got our fingers crossed. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. <laughs> okay. So about Mohawk Tannery. I'm Matt, we haven't met. I'm Sandy Belknap. Um, I've been involved with this since 1998 when after I saw the movie A Civil Action and just wondered what was going on at Mohawk Tannery. So here we are 25 years later. I'm very excited. The plan that we were shown by the developers and Bernie Plant has been fantastic by keeping in touch with the neighborhood. This is the first time anybody's been so engaged. He has a lot to ride on this. He lives in Nashua. He has a reputation. So um, it's been really good that he's been connected with us. So, you know, I'm, I'm, we'll see what happens. I mean, it might end up being <laughs> it's not going to work. But that plan that was shown to the Board of Aldermen last week, that was what the Mohawk Tannery Planning Committee talked about back in 2004, 2005. Ex with the exception of a vineyard being grown back there. There was a company <laughs> from Ohio yeah, that suggested ask. a vineyard. <laughs> New Hampshire wine's terrible, so I'd <laughs> not suggest that. We, we would lose money on that. We want to get money. Like so just, so just uh, you know, I just want to, you kept looking at me, Mayor Don, just every time Mohawk came up, everybody's looking at me. So I just wanted to say that I have no questions right now. The neighbors are going to have questions as far as when the construction starts, but according to Bernie, when he called me last week, um, we're going to start having meetings soon. He's going to be sending out letters to the neighborhood. And um, again, that's pretty impressive that he's doing that and there's a nice collaboration. So I just want to thank the city of Nashua. I, you know, and I want the city of Nashua to keep the communication going too. That way we're not just hearing from, we're hearing both sides. And that's what's going to be really important from my perspective since for so long I've been kind of the voice of the neighborhood. I'm trying to back out of that a little bit because we have a new generation of neighbors coming in. I thought this would be done by the time I turned 50. Hopefully b before I so turn 60. So now hopefully before I turn 60 <laughs> we can go down there. But to walk down, we can walk, we're going to be able to walk down to the river. I mean it's, we all see the value that this will bring to our properties in our neighborhood. Um, because we live kind of on a peninsula up there on, in the Fairmount Heights area and you know, we're so close to downtown, and yeah, and people ride their bikes. They're like, how do I get to Mayan Falls? I can see it on GPS. I'm like, you can't get there. We might. There. We might so be able to create a walking bridge. That's oh, what you we're excited saw that. about. So, From anyway. this into Mayan Falls. So that, so that but whenever Mohawk comes up, that's for people that don't know me. That's why everybody looks at me. So um, <laughs> thank you for that. Right. And um, I guess look forward to the neighbors starting to come together because if the the special meeting last week at the Board of Aldermen, I knew about it. I was on my way to go there. I didn't realize it was before the Board of Aldermen meeting. Mm. So I had the wrong time, and I told all my neighbors the wrong time. But we watched it on Channel 16, just so you know. So um, we're excited. All right. Now, Lori, you have anything? I have nothing. Um, Cindy? Uh, Mayor, I just wanted to comment, uh, yes. because it was mentioned, the rail trail extension. I did talk to Director Sullivan, and if I'm getting this right, um, well, if I'm getting it wrong, let me know. But um, there's an acquisition problem where there was uh, a right-of-way easement that we need to get before we can move forward with that, because we had heard a couple of years ago that it was like, we got the funding, we have the plan, yeah. everything's so moving what, forward. Can you... Uh, yeah, I, can, I can... Tom, I'll grab the mic. I'll just toss it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I died. Um, quickly, S Sandy, I actually, for the first six years of my life, I grew up on Huey Street, so I oh. know the area really okay. well. And so this has been a neat project for me to work on, but Tim and the mayor and others deserve a ton of credit for bringing it forward. It's been really fun to work on the project. But to Tom's comment, uh, so the Heritage Rail Trail East is what we're referring to, the extension of the rail trail to the east side of Main Street, obviously. There's been a tremendous work, amount of work done there to bring forward a design plan that can be implemented, and we've secured funding for uh, the construction of the trail. What's gotten a bit more complicated uh, 
If you're not familiar, there are several levels of design involved with a large infrastructure project. And we're currently in the process of completing what we refer to as preliminary design. And when we were in that process, we identified an issue where when the city had laid out the right-of-way or the area that the trail was going to go through, it didn't necessarily incorporate all of the engineering details that needed to be incorporated. And as a result, we actually believe we need to secure additional right-of-way, not large portions, but small portions here and there along the rail trail and where it's proposed in order to actually actually execute the project in the way that we and the community had envisioned, of course. And so where we're at right now is that the project, I wouldn't say it's on hold because it's not, but we're working actively with our engineer to identify what those right-of-way areas are that are particularly problematic to execute the project. We're likely going to be uh, engaging in a level of right-of-way discussion with property owners at some point. And again, we don't know exactly where these spots are. Uh, but those areas we think are absolutely critical to building the rail trail in the way that the community envisioned it. And so we sort of put the project on hold functionally while we have those discussions with the project, uh, the property owners. But one advantage we have is that we've secured funding. Uh, one disadvantage of, uh, that we have is that funding is really in 2019 or 2018 dollars, and so I expect we'll have a need for additional funding when we actually go to construction and we resolved all these issues. But the project has a tremendous amount of momentum. It's one of the mayor's, uh, I think, top priority infrastructure projects from a pedestrian bike infrastructure uh, perspective in the downtown, really in the whole community. And so it's not been forgotten. We're working actively with engineering to try and bring it forward, but we, run, we have run into some challenges on the project. All right. Any questions? Thank you. All right. Well, it's a snowy night, and uh, we usually try to finish by, by or before 7. So we are open to any other questions, but... Uh, without any, we probably just uh, thank you for coming. And okay, go ahead. Yes, please. Well, we don't have a question. Um, my name is Ivan Niger. I own a house just a couple over from Fred. Um, we are new to the community. Um, we bought the house from our son, who um, who continues to live there. And we do have so. It's okay. Um, they need a TV. TV. Yeah. I. Um, my wife and I are thinking that we would move in eventually full time, but we do have some concerns about security. Um, I work in a field of historic preservation. Uh, I'm thinking about that I would move my business up here, and um, I, I'm an expert actually on the masonry for canals. I wrote the plan for the restoration of the Blackstone River Canal, as well as the infrastructure that goes underneath the mill. So. We feel like we have a lot that we could um, contribute, but we'd like to get back in touch with you, Mayor. Yeah, yeah, I've of course. You a couple of times. Um, did we answer? No. I have. No, no did answer. we answer? No, no. I haven't heard back from you. So yeah, that's I'd like not to good. get back in touch now that you can put a face to it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes when we get stuff out of town, we prioritize things that probably come from the city. But it's good that I know we know who you are. So, yes, good. that sounds interesting. Good. All right, thank All right, you very thank much. You. So can you give your contact information to Jenny here, just so uh, we make sure we make the connection? So where do you live now? We live in uh, Arlington. And, and you're we, thinking? We're here a lot, because we've been renovating the house. And what house do you, do you have? Which what number? Yeah. 11 grand. Number 11. 11 grand, yeah. yes. Well, we're trying to take 12. Is it 12, 14 for property taxes? 12. 12. Yeah, there's a lot of problems at 12. It, 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 well, it, it, all right. It's what? 12, it takes a quite a while to do that, but uh, we've gotten a lot of neighborhood complaints about that. But then you that. understand why we have some security concerns. Yeah, that's why, right? You do understand. Yes, yeah, that is yeah, yeah. exactly why. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're so we're moving to, um, we've taken the first steps to uh, uh, take the property for unpaid property taxes. and it's ten and a half years. It's been a long time. Texas. It's been a long time. So something should have been done before, but we are now doing it. And uh, it, but it, the process that the state sets forth in state law is time-consuming. Like you don't really a, ha, uh, have the ability to take it for a couple of years after you first start to tell them you might be doing this. So, and then there's a redemption. But we think they would not redeem. They would not come back because of you know, the obvious problems that exist over there. And uh, anyway, we are trying to uh, address it. 
Yeah, I, you know, we've personally, I've talked to the people at like thir 13, I, you know, we've definitely heard about this. I mean, and, and seen it, and you know, it's a big problem, right? I mean, I get that. A very, yeah, a very large problem, All right? Not that you can so those that. are the security concerns you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah, I wonder. It seemed like, eh, probably that. Uh, yeah. But I didn't, I didn't know. You, uh, anyway, we're working on it. Okay. Because we really would like to live here. Yeah. And we really would like to, um, for the balance of the years, that I have my business. And um, yeah. we have a lot that we could, we could offer this community. That'd be great. And Terrific. It's a lovely house. Yeah. And it's so nice. These are really historic. Built houses, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. And it's, and yeah. Mine Falls Park is wonderful. Yeah. And, um, you know, I understand. We've seen some of the homeless encamp encampments in the park. I understand why they're there. I understand why it happens. That's not the issue that we have. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that, this, this, this 12, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we're working on that. Okay. All right. Well, maybe we'll adjourn for the night, but uh, thank you for pointing out things. And Sandy, thanks for coming. Fred. Thank uh, you, Mr. Mayor. And, um, Lori, Cindy, Tom, thank you all for coming. And uh, again, we're open to any kind of suggestions or questions. If you uh, have them, just get in touch.